the uh, last message in this series with you on grace. And uh, I've enjoyed this series very much, as I do all of the series. Uh, and this one's called Hope Versus Despair. This is a great story, and uh, I've read it several times from several different areas, and it just pulls up my heart so much. It's about a missionary couple called David and Sevilla Flood. That's their names. And it was in 1921 when this missionary couple from Sweden with their two-year-old son went to the heart of Africa that was then called the Belgian Congo. I think today it's called the People's Democratic Republic of Congo, something like that. But it was the Belgian Congo until 1960. And it was here that they met up with another missionary couple and the four of them decided to take the gospel to a remote area where people had never heard of the name of Jesus. Unfortunately, when they arrived, the chief of the tribe wouldn't let them live in the village. So they were forced to live about a mile away and the only contact with anyone from the village was with a young boy whom the chief allowed to come and sell them food, in particular it was eggs and to bring that food to them. Now the missionary wife, Sevilla, ended up leading that young boy to the faith. He came to know Jesus in a personal way through her contact with the daily food. But that was the only progress. That was it. The little boy, seven or eight, who had come bringing eggs and some foods, she got to personally to Jesus, but that was it. They never had contact with anyone else from the village because the chief said, no one from the village is allowed to interact with you. Eventually, the other couple contracted malaria. And as a result of getting malaria, they left. And the floods, as a couple with the young son, was left on their own. And soon, Sevilla, who was pregnant, also contracted malaria. She died several days after giving birth. And her husband dug a crude grave and buried his 27-year-old wife and went back to the main mission statement. He gave his newborn child to the missionaries and said, I'm going back to Sweden. I've lost my wife and I can't take care of this baby. So he said to another group of missionaries, you have my child. I can't imagine the grief that this man was going through. And he said this, he says, God has ruined my life. God has ruined my life. And he took his son and he left. And these missionaries adopted his baby daughter. And when their time had finished in the Congo, they brought her back to the United States to raise her. This man's life seemed completely ruined, ruined beyond repair. From his perspective, this is how his story ended. There was no coming back from such tragedy and such a loss. You know, I was thinking, and I was thinking like this. Eventually, all of us reach a point in our life or a point in our story where we feel like we don't want to keep on reading on how our life goes because the challenge that seems to be before us just seems too overwhelming. We can feel like our relationship with God and with each other is too broken. We can feel that the situations or the circumstances we find ourselves in are just too impossible. We can find that the pain that we are carrying is too much. And I know that this missionary man, David Flood, had reached that point as he returned back to Sweden. You know, I think, have you ever felt that you were at a point like that? Or perhaps you might feel like you are at a point like that right now in your own life. You deal with as much as you can for as long as you can, but eventually the pain just seems to be too much. But here's a question I was pondering. What if what feels like the end of your story is actually just the middle of your story? What if what you feel like is the end of your story is just the middle of your story so far? The Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purpose. 
All things, not some things. All things, not just the pleasant things. Paul tells us that the author of our story, he tells us that the one directing our lives is trustworthy and that he has promised to bring a good ending to our story no matter how bad the chapter we're currently in might seem. The chapter of your life story might just seem so horrendous and hideous and despicable, despairing, annoying. That like David Flood, you just say, I'm ruined and go back to where you came from. But what I'm suggesting is perhaps that this most awkward or difficult or horrendous situation is not the end of your life, but rather the middle of a story that God has for you. What do I call that? A promise. A promise of what? Of God's grace. Let's be honest. When you are the one who's hurting, when it's your health that's failing, when it's your marriage that seems to be falling apart, when it's your child who is struggling in the faith, when it's your job that has been eliminated, when the pain is just too much, the very idea that God's grace can work things out for good seems at best naive, but can also seem almost offensive. That there's a lack of sensitivity or understanding or empathy to your situation. When the pain seems too much, simple platitudes don't do much to make us feel better. But the promise must seem just so unbelievable to the Christians in Rome who first heard and read this letter from Paul. When Paul wrote to the believers in Rome who were persecuted and attacked for their faith, and Paul says, be at rest because all things work together for good to those who love Him. If you think it's difficult to read that in your situation, imagine how it must have felt in the situation of those believers who were facing certain death. But because of their faith, they were able to face potential loss of work, of life, of family, because they're able to recognize through the teaching of Paul that even through the difficulties that they were facing, the hardships, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the danger and the sword, Paul would assure them in his letter in Romans 8, 37, that in all these things that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In the Greek, the conquerors there, more than, well, conquerors is Nike and more than is hyper Nike. That's where you get that shoe name from, Nike, which means conqueror. Hyper Nike, more than is hyper Nike, more than conquerors for him who loved us. Paul goes on to say in verse 39 that neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul wanted the believers who are under attack in Rome to understand that no matter how desperate things may seem in the moment, God's love and in particular His grace will win the day. We'll win the day. You say, I could do with some winning, Pastor. Now, Paul wasn't calling for blind optimism. He doesn't say, well, we believe hope or we're pretty sure. But rather, he says, we know. I love that. We know. We know that God works for the good of those who love Him. He spoke with a certainty. He spoke with an authority. He says, we know. He didn't say, well, I believe. I hope. I'm fairly sure. I'm pretty sure, in fact. He said, we know. In the Greek, if you look at those words, we know, it means absolute. It means unshakable. It means confidence. So Paul is speaking with the certainty of a man who somehow has glimpsed the redeeming work of God's grace in his life. And he says, we know. 
The other time that Paul speaks of this Greek words, meaning we know, is in Romans 8.22. When Paul is talking about the pain of this life and how this world could be pretty messed up, in the midst of pain and a messed up life, he again writes in Romans 8.22, he says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning. I love that text of Scripture. When I hear about earthquakes, when I hear about things happening, I always think of Romans 8.22, that this world is groaning. This world is crying out. Did you know when you look historically, into the major earthquakes. Historically, it's recorded that from the death of Christ, when there was an earthquake that hit at the death of Christ onwards, the Roman Empire had never seen so many earthquakes and things happening in that world. We keep waiting for them, but I'm telling you, from the death of Christ, there was an earthquake that came and hit and it split and the temple curtain torn too. From that moment, the earth groaned and said, we await the coming of our Lord. I believe it's not only believers who wait, but the whole of creation awaits for the coming of the Lord. You see, we hope that what we think will be great, but creation has known what was good. And it groans to what's good. And every time I hear of a move, I don't think of some sort of climate change. I think of creation saying, I want them back. <laughs> I want them back. So do I. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no cancer in heaven. So in faith, I'll pray against heaven on earth. I'm sorry, I'll pray against cancer on earth. I want heaven on earth. There's no breakups in heaven, so I pray against breakups on earth. I speak life. We know that the whole creation has been groaning. Paul says two things. Verse 22, life can be hard. Verse 28, but God is good. <laughs> Verse 22, life can be hard. Verse 28, God is good. I was sharing last week, and I said, the Bible never says that life will always be happy. The Bible doesn't say that you'll always be happy. But the Bible does say in Philippians, rejoice always. The Bible doesn't say, I'll always be happy, but it says, rejoice always. And again, I say, rejoice. It says, have joy, for the joy of the Lord is my salvation. The Bible says, come with thanks. Have an attitude of thanks. The Bible doesn't tell me life will always be happy, but it says that I can rejoice. And it says that I should be thankful. And it says there is joy in my salvation. Sometimes the space between life being hard and God works all things together for good seems like an eternity in the space in between. Say, well, Pastor, I've seen a lot of life hard. I'd just like to see some things that are good. Well, there's good happening all the time. Let me finish telling you a story about David Flood, Swedish missionary, who moved his young family all the way to the Congo, Belgian Congo in Africa, to see just one child come to faith whom his wife led to the Lord. His wife died of malaria just after she gave birth to their daughter whom he gave away. Furious with God, burying his wife, he gave his baby away to a missionary couple from the United States. and He went back to Sweden with a small boy. Well, let me tell you about that girl, Aggie. She grew up in the United States with Christian, God-fearing parents. Remember, at birth, just a couple of days old, she was given away. So she never knew the story. One day, this is how God moves. It's just so marvelous. One day, she checked her mailbox. And for some unknown reason, she found a Swedish magazine. And she was flipping through it when a photo stopped her cold. It was a picture of of a crude grave with a white cross. And on the cross was the name Sylvia Flood. And she recognized her mother's name. And she took the magazine to someone who could translate the story because she didn't know the Swedish language, her mother tongue. 
And she took it to someone to translate the story that accompanied the photo. And Aggie sat there and listened to the story about the work her mother had done as a missionary. Sometime later, she traveled to Sweden to find her father. It turned out that he had remarried. He had fathered four more children, and he was an alcoholic. In fact, he was dying from alcoholism. In fact, when she met him, he only had a day or two to live. After an emotional meeting with her half-siblings, Aggie brought up the subject of seeing her dad. And they hesitated, and they explained, you can't talk to our father about Jesus. He's extremely ill. And you need to know that whenever he hears the name of God, whenever he hears the name of Jesus, even now he flies into a rage. But Aggie, the daughter he gave away, wasn't deterred. And she walked into his tiny apartment and saw empty liquor bottles everywhere. And she approached a 73-year-old man who had deserted her years before. And as soon as she said the words, Papa, he knew. He knew it was his daughter. And he began to cry and he began to sob. And he began to apologize profusely. She said, it's all right, Papa. God took care of me. Instantly, he stiffened and his tears stopped running. And he yelled out, God forgot all of us. And he turned his face to the wall. Our lives have been like this because of him. And only as a daughter can, she said, Papa, I've got a story to tell you. And it's a true story. The little boy that you and Mama led to the Lord grew up. And he led his entire village to faith in Jesus. He now pastors that village. The one seed that you planted just kept growing and growing and growing. And today, more than 600 African people are serving the Lord because you are faithful to the call of the God in your life. You didn't go to Africa in vain. Mama didn't die in vain. Papa, Jesus loves you and he has never hated you. David flooded 73 with stunned. His muscles relaxed and the conversation continued. But at the end of the day, he'd come back to receive Christ as Saviour and Lord. Within weeks, he passed away, but into the hands of God. I love God's grace. God knew his time was short. And his best ambassador was an abandoned daughter. What if instead of closing the book, he would have just kept on reading? What if at the loss of his wife and the hardship of the land, instead of closing that book, he just kept on reading? See, one of the reasons why we have a hard time believing that God's grace is working for good in our lives is because of how we define the word good. We have our own ideas of how good should work for our good. Ideas that range from a cancer-free report to an on-time flight. But I tend to think that God is working for my good, then everything that happens to me should work out according to my definition of good. But when something not so good happens to me, then we can think that God somehow is not keeping His promises. Some of you are battling with the word good right now. When things are working out for you, you say, God is good. But it's your definition of good, not God's. And when things aren't working out for good, you think that God has broken His promise, that God has broken His word, that somehow God has let you down. And like David Flood, you can end the book instead of realizing it's only a chapter. 
You can close the book without realizing that it's not the end, it's only a middle, it's a pause, it's halfway. We tend to think that God working for our good means we won't experience pain and will somehow be exempt from suffering of this world. It's like I said to someone the other day, in the Garden of Eden before the fall, did pain exist? And they said, no. I said, yes, it did. In Genesis 3, 16, the Lord says to Eve, because of her part in the sin, he said, your pain will be greatly increased. It it means pain was already there. How else would she know how to push when it was time? See, we think all pain is bad, but it was pain that brought me to Jesus. It was pain that brought my mother to Jesus, who then shared to me. It was pain that spoke to Sandra when her dad died in finding hope and finding Jesus. Praise God, you didn't need pain to find Jesus. But there's an awful lot of us who can rejoice for painful moments because it made us seek God. But God's definition of good is different from ours. So what's God's definition of good? Well, number one, you can know God's grace is working in your pain to draw you close to Jesus. That's good. In my pain, I know God is at work and he's bringing me closer to him, not from him. Because God won't waste my pain, but rather God can use my pain and work it to call our hearts closer to Him. In the Living Bible, in 2 Corinthians 7.10, it reads like this. For God sometimes uses sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek eternal life. When Adam sinned against God, there was a pain that he felt that brought him back to knowing God. It's pain that brings us through. What you thought was the worst thing that ever happened to you could end up being the best thing that ever happened to you because it brought you closer to Jesus. That's the difference that grace makes. It doesn't always take away our pain, but it does something better. It redeems our pain. And you know what? We need our pain redeemed. In our pain, we discover the presence of Jesus in a way that we would never have otherwise. Secondly, defining grace here is that you can know that God's grace is working in your pain to make you more like Jesus. God's grace takes all the broken pieces of our lives and puts them together so that we look more like Jesus. After promising that in all things God is working for the good in our lives, Paul gives a further explanation of at least one way that God brings about goodness. In Romans 8, 22, he says this, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Foreknew. God is all-knowing. And his knowledge is not limited to our linear timetable. He lives outside of time and space and he sees everything at once. He not only knows everything that has happened, but also everything that will happen as if it already has happened. And you'll never hear God say, wow, that caught me by surprise. How did that happen? God already knows what I have to endure. And I believe according to Corinthians that he's already equipped me for that day. Well, pastor, I wish I'd been to Bible school right now. He's already equipped you. Well, I wish I'd been saved a bit longer. He's already equipped you. It's like when David went to face Goliath, he didn't go, oh my goodness, I I, I wish I went to cadets, cadets course and learned at least how to use a weapon. But rather God said, even as a shepherd boy that was despised, I've been preparing you how to do battle. Knowing what we would go through, God made a decision in advance. He'd send us Jesus. And that's what I love about Jesus. He's the King of Kings. Uh, You won't find uh, uh, Prince Charles or Prince, what's his son's name? William going ahead of the armies. They'll be back in London. Oh, they'll do a couple of trips to say, G'day, G'day, how you doing? Okay, but they'll be at the back. Now, King Jesus, he says, I've already set a course for you. A trail, a path's already been laid because I went before you and I faced those demons. I faced that sickness. I faced that prejudice. I faced that hatred. I faced that hardship. I've gone before you, just got on the path I've already laid. The worldly king says, which way do we go? Jesus says, follow me. See, his grace and our pain is a promise that whatever pain we go through in this life, it's not wasted. Why? Because my pain and your pain gives birth to something good. Lisa, do you mind? What's the difference between reason and purpose? 
Reason looks for a because. So many of us are going through things and we're going this, what's the reason for this? What's the reason for this sickness? What's the reason for this strain in a relationship? What's the reason for the uncertainty? What's the reason? But my Bible doesn't talk about a reason. My God talks about a purpose. You see, reason looks for a because and purpose focuses on for. Reason wants a logical explanation that'll make sense out of something that has happened, but purpose offers us a hope that whatever has happened, God can work for good. Because purpose says, it'll all work together for good to those who love Him. That's purpose. God has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for me. And whatever I go through, there's purpose. When something happens in my life, I said, there's a purpose for this, Lord. I don't get caught up saying, well, what's the reason? Or what could I have done? What should I have done? I said, there's a purpose. All things work out for good to those who love Him. And God, I know you and I know there's a purpose. Do you remember in John 9, when Jesus, okay, and his disciples came across a man who'd been born blind. And Jesus' disciples says, who was at fault, the mother or the father? In Luke 13, Jesus shares about the news they received that a a tower had fallen in Siloam and killed 18 innocent people. And the people are asking, why did this happen? What's the explanation? But Jesus' answer is like this. These things happen, but watch for the work of God to be accomplished here. You know what I find interesting about that John 9 experience with the blind man and what I find in Luke 13 about the tower that fell that could have been an aqueduct of the water. If you've been to Israel, and I pray you all get to go there, and you go down the Hezekiah's tunnel, as Sam and I have done it, and you go for the Hezekiah's tunnel, it comes all the way out to the water or the stream of Siloam. You know what I find the great link is between John 9 with the blind man being healed and Luke 13, the tower of Siloam, is that the blind man was also at Siloam because Jesus spat and made mud, right? And He put it on His eyes. He says, go to the waters of Siloam. Now, if you look up the meaning of the, 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 the word Siloam uh, in, bio, in baby names, and I don't go by baby names, okay? It means uh, something like a bow or, 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 a, or a sword or a spear or armor or a weapon. But literally in the, in the origins of Latin as it come through there, it means sent or sent forth because if you understand Hezekiah's tunnel, the aqueducts, it comes all the way through and it's sent forth out into the streams, Siloam. And when Jesus spat and made mud, sounds gross, doesn't it? Spat and made mud and put it, good thing you couldn't see what was happening, right? And put it on his eyes. He said, now go wash off in the streams of Siloam. It's in this place in John 9 and Luke 13, that the people are saying, what is it all about? With the blind man, uh, whose fault was it? When the tower fell and 18 died, what's the meaning of this area? And Jesus is saying, the issue is not what the reasoning is, but what the purpose is. What the purpose is that God will be glorified. God will be glorified. How many times have we stumbled in our faith because we're trying to find the reason? We're trying to find the reason because our intellect wants to somehow understand, that we think that by understanding we can believe, but when you know that God has a purpose in every situation, you don't need reason, you just have faith. God's grace to us in our pain is that our pain has a purpose. Not that God designed you to have pain, but there is a purpose and that God can work through it to make us more like Jesus. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, For our present troubles are small and won't last. Not very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at our troubles that we can see now. Rather, Paul says, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. When I was a kid, I had to memorize in the old King James. So he said, we don't look upon that which is seen, but that which is unseen. For that which is seen is temporary, but that which is unseen is eternal. Where is your gaze today? Where is your focus today? 
Is your focus on that momentary problem? Is your focus on that circumstance? Are you fixated on having to know the reason why? I need to know the reason why. I need to know the reason why. I want to challenge you that rather work on the reason, work on the purpose. That God could be glorified in your life. Good. God will bring good out of your bad. And even if you can't currently see how God might be drawing you closer or getting glory from your pain, you still need to remember this. You're in the middle of your story. This is not the end of your story. You have to keep on reading. Don't close the book like David Flood did because when he had that little girl, Aggie, come to visit him decades later, decades later, She said, Dad, the book wasn't closed. Now, his life was closing, but she kept telling him the book wasn't closed. It's not only, Daddy, that I'm saved and my husband and my children serving God, but that little boy that you might have thought was meaningless is now the spiritual leader of six, eight hundred different people in that land. If we just keep reading, if we keep pressing through, we'll see that grace always has the final word. Life is hard, but God is good. You've got to keep reading because grace is greater. Grace is greater. Grace is greater than everything and anything we go through. His grace is greater. I want you to know, church, whatever your story is, whatever your journey is about, God's grace is at work. And I know we want to know all the answers and I know we want to know all the reasons. But there comes a point where we just got to say, God, you're in control. Be glorified in my life situation now. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. I don't know why people only memorize that first half. The second half says, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Psalm 1 says that we are to be like trees planted by the water. I think it's around Jeremiah 17, 19 that talks about us being trees planted by the living waters that not only will our leaves give shade, but also it'll be a healing balm until those who come to us. So even as I stood at a funeral, and I dealt with a ter- horrendous situation where a man took his own life in his garage by hanging himself. His son having to cut the rope and his father trying to hold him and his wife endeavoring to do CPR. Not of sound mind, he took his life. And then what can happen so easily, certain family members, not the immediate, but family say, what's the reason? Then all the blame comes in. Well, perhaps it was his wife's fault. It's a mental, medical assessment's fault. Maybe it's the church's fault that you didn't really get them converted. Maybe it was this fault or this fault. We start asking the reason. Rather than realizing that out of something terrible, God can bring good. And I shared that him. John 10.10, 10. I knew it was a scripture used for a funeral. I said, John 10.10, 10. it says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I'm coming, you might have life and have it more abundantly. That thief is not the devil. It's incorrect when Christians say that's the devil. It doesn't say that. In John 9, it talks about other so-called believers who are ruining your effective Christian walk. It's not talking about the devil. It's talking about other Christians. And you know, that's the worst thing. Other Christians want to ruin it for other Christians. 
Other Christians want to ruin Christians from having a life of abundance. So I shared the story of John 9. Whose fault? Jesus says, don't worry about the fault. Realize that good will come. And we shared about what's God's love, not your love, but God's love. God's love forgives. God's love keeps no record of wrongs. God's love thinks of the best. God's love is enduring. God's love is patient. God's love is kind. And I looked at the three children, the daughter and two sons, and we said, what these children need right now is not bickering and reasoning, but we need people to take the place of a father. An uncle, an aunt, a grandparent, a great-grandparent to step up and say, we can do nothing for the dead, but for the living, we need to live. Because God hasn't promised you life. He's called your life in abundance. So if the enemy's come in to steal your joy, I can guarantee you it won't be so much a demonic presence as it will be in fellow brothers and sisters sometimes stealing the joy of our salvation. What you need to focus on is not the reason for it, but rather focus on the purpose of grace, that all things work together for good. When someone comes to me and they say, Pastor, it's unfair, this has happened. I said, it's all for good. Forgive, let go, release, and see how God will turn it around. Could you bow your heads right now? Father, in the name of Yeshua, my Lord, my Saviour, you said, Lord, in John 9 and John 10, there's only one gate, one door to know you. You said, Lord, there are others who try to jump over the fence and come by other ways. But we're not meant to be fooled because there's only one door and one gate. And Jesus, you said, your own words were, I am the door. <laughs> I am the door. You didn't say you are one of the doors. You are one of many doors. You are the door. Lord, you said in your word in John 5 that if we want to honour the Father, we have to honour the Son. That if we don't honour the Son, we do not honour the Father. There are not other ways to access the Father. Lord, you said in Matthew 10 that if we would confess you before others, you also would confess us to the Lord God Almighty. But if we would deny you, then you also would deny us. For you said, Lord, it's not merely the confession of the mouth, but it's the belief in the heart. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has risen the dead, then you shall be saved. In verse 10, you said this, with the mouth you confess, but with the heart you believe. Lord, our believing might only be tiny right now. But Lord, faith the size of a mustard seed can grow into a mighty tree. I pray that seeds of faith would be planted right now.